Today, we are going to continue talking about the um, admin PIM architecture, the first uh, commercially available PIM architecture. And in particular, we are going to uh, talk about the micro benchmarking study that we did with this uh, architecture in order to figure out the internal characteristics of the architecture. Um, whenever you want to uh, ask any question, please uh, don't hesitate to stop me. And um, I will also keep an eye on the YouTube chat in case that there are any questions there. So remember this slide is a, uh, let's say flagship slide for the admin beam architecture where we can see some uh, DIMMs and these DIMMs contain uh, several chips, uh, eight or, or, or 16 chips typically. And inside the chips, we have memory arrays, DRAM memory arrays, and we also have uh, small processors called, called DRAM processing units or DPUs. If we take a closer look at the system, uh, we identify the admin DIMMs that coexist with uh, main memory DIMMs, uh, conventional DRAM typically. And in each of the DIMMs, we have, as I said before, eight or 16 chips, and these uh, represent one or two ranks of uh, eight chips each. What is what we have inside each pin chip? There are eight DRAM banks called NRAM of size 64 megabytes in the current generation of this architecture. And then there are eight DRAM processing units or DPUs. Each DPU can access one NRAM bank. If we take a closer look at the internals of the DRAM pro or, the, or the pin chip, uh, we find the uh, control and status interface for the uh, CPU to communicate with the pipeline of the DPU. We also have a DDR4 interface for the CPU to access the DRAM banks then here we have the eight DRAM banks and, and um, the corresponding DMA engines to access them. And um, the way we access them is by either moving instructions from the MRAM to the IRAM or moving operands back and forth between the MRAM and the WRAM, which is a scratch pad or software manage, manage cache. And remember as well that we have a pipeline and this pipeline has 14 stages. The current generation, or let's say the most uh, uh, powerful version of the admin pin system right now has uh, DPUs that can run at, at frequency of 425 megahertz. Uh, for the experiments that I'm going to show here, the, the experimental results that I'm going to show in this lecture, we used a system that uh, can run at a frequency of 350 megahertz. Um, the pipeline, as you may remember, is fine-grained multi-threaded. It can uh, hold up to 24 hardware threads. And in total, it has this pipeline, 14 pipeline stages that you can see on the slide. Uh, the ISA, the instruction set architecture of this uh, admin PIM architecture is a specific 32-bit ISA. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it uh, also allows compilation of 64-bit um, uh, code and, and the compiler is uh, LLVM based. Okay, so now we are going to start understanding even more about these um, uh, DPUs and about this uh, PIM architecture. And the way to do this is to uh, per do some microbenchmarking. The idea of microbenchmarking in general is like um, using very simple programs, programs that can somehow help us characterize what are the um, inner and characteristics of this architecture. And in the end, what we are going to do here is uh, measuring these um, uh, basic characteristics, such as the arithmetic throughput or the bandwidth to the two main memory spaces that we can use for uh, data and for operands. So we are going to start exactly with the um, arithmetic throughput that the DPU pipeline can achieve. Uh, in the figure, you also see the WRAM because the WRAM is the place where we store the operands, input and output operands. So every time that we perform an operation, we will um, we will read data from WRAM and we will write results uh, to WRAM. Let's take a look at uh, you know that micro benchmark that we prepared to measure the arithmetic throughput. The goal, as uh, we already said, is uh, to me um, measure the maximum arithmetic throughput for different data types and operations. And to do so, what we do is create in this micro benchmark. In this micro benchmark, you're going to see it in the next slide. In this micro benchmark, what we essentially do is 
uh, going over one array in WRAM and performing operations on the elements of this array. In particular, we perform a read, modify, write operation on each element of the array. We run our experiments on a single DPU and we vary the number of tasklets from one to 24. And we use different arithmetic operations, addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division, and for different data types, uh, integers of 32 bits or 64 bits, and then floating point, either single precision and double precision. To perform our measurements, we use an accurate cycle, cycle counter that the SDK provides. And in our measurements, we include the accesses to WRAM, as I said before, not only the arithmetic operation, let's say the addition where the um, operands are already stored in a register, because these operands, these input operands are going to come from WRAM. We are including the accesses to WRAM in our measurements. So let's take a look at the um, at this uh, example micro benchmark. In particular, this one is for addition of 32-bit integers. And as you can see, and in, in the top of the slide, you see the C base code. This is what we uh, write. This is a high-level language code that we write. As you can see, it's pretty simple. Uh, at the, in the bottom part of the slide, what we see is the compiled code in the DPU ISA. Uh, as I said, the code is very simple. You see that the, the only thing that we are doing here is going over one array of a certain size. We go over all elements of the array, read these elements, perform some operation, in this case, uh, an addition, and then uh, we store the result back in the same position. This um, array called buffer A in this um, particular slide, it's uh, allocated in WRAM. And the way of allocating um, memory space in, in WRAM is by using this memalloc, as you see. So if we take a look at how this, uh, the compiler compiles this C-based code into uh, the DPU ISA, um, here we can identify the for loop and this for loop uh, gets compiled to this um, move instruction that initializes the index, that is the index of the loop that is going to be stored in R2. And then at the bottom, we have the um, increment of the, um, of the index and then a jam, a conditional jam, essentially checking here whether we reach the bound or not. So here we have the access to WRAM. Notice that um, we it's not only reading the load operation itself, but also we have to calculate the address based on what's the base address of the array and what's the index that is stored in R2, as you know. <clears throat> here we have the addition operation. And here we have the store operation. Observe that for this store operation, we don't need to calculate the address because the address is the same that we calculated before because we are writing in the same output uh, array, in the same position indeed. So if we execute this code, this micro benchmark on one DPU, what we obtain is something like this, the arithmetic throughput that you can see in the Y axis of these four plots um, changes with the number of tasklets that we use in the experiment. The number, the tasklets, as you uh, may remember, are the software threads that we use in our program. And, um, and so in this um, curve here, you can see how the arithmetic throughput increases as we increase the number of tasklets. And at some point it saturates and remains flat. Um, observe as well that uh, here in this curve or in these two curves, we have uh, the results for addition and the results for subtraction for 32-bit um, integers on one DPU. These are the results for multiplication and division, and these are the results for different data types. And one key observation here is that the uh, saturation point is always at 11 tasklets. So the maximum arithmetic throughput that we can achieve inside a DRAM processing unit is uh, at 11 or more tasklets. And this observation is consistent across data types and across operations, as you can see in the slide. There is also something interesting here to observe is um, the difference in um, maximum throughput that we have between 32-bit integers and 64-bit integers. There is a difference of about 17% here. Um, and we want to explain why this happens. And we can 
we can um, you know, imagine what, what, what are the reasons, but we are going to see it uh, quite clearly, I believe. Because the peak throughput is achieved at 11 tasklets, uh, we are going to assume that we are um, uh, filling the whole pipeline with 11 or more tasklets. And what that means in a pipeline uh, processor is that every cycle, we retire one instruction. Every cycle, one instruction completes. So in the end, we have a throughput of one instruction per cycle. However, here we are not talking only about uh, instructions, we are talking about operations. And remember that, for example, the addition operation entails to go to read, uh, to, to, to the WRAM, read one value and then perform an addition and then store back uh, to WRAM. So the number of instructions that we are using for each, each operation is, it's going to be more than one. So the way to estimate the arithmetic throughput for a specific operation depends on the frequency of the DPU. Remember that the inverse of the frequency of the DPU is the, um, the, the, the duration of one cycle, that is the amount of time that we have to wait until the next instruction uh, gets completed in the pipeline. And here we have the, the number of instructions that we need for this specific operation. And now we are going to check what our compiler produces for both the microbenchmark for 32-bit integers and the microbenchmark for 64-bit integers. And here on the right-hand side, what we see is the compiled code. This is the for loop for 32-bit um, uh, integers, and this is the for loop for 64-bit integers. And if we compare both, we see that the only difference is this instruction, this at C instruction. Remember that this ISA, the ISA of the DPU is 32-bit, is a 32-bit ISA. However, it also, the, the, the DPUs also support 64-bit um, operands, right? So in these instructions, we are operating on 32 bit on elements of 32 bits, while here in this code, we want to operate on elements of 64 bits. And the way to do that, the way to support the addition for 64 bits is to have this at C, which is an addition with carry. So in the first addition, we add the 32 bits, the least um, significant 32 bits of the uh, input operands. And with the add C, we sum the carry that comes from the previous uh, sum uh, plus the um, uh, most, the, the 32 most significant bits of the 64 bit operands. So in summary, the difference is uh, that one um, operation uses six instructions while the other operation uses seven instructions. And based on that, sorry, based on that, we can estimate the arithmetic throughput as um, 58.33 mega operations per second for the 32-bit addition and subtraction, 50 um, mega operations per second for the 64-bit addition and subtraction because it's using um, seven instructions. And exactly these um, um, e estimates that we have here at the bottom of the slide are exactly or very, very similar to what we are measuring on the real DPU and you can find in the in the upper plots. Feel free to stop me if there are any questions. Okay, another observation is the large throughput difference that we see between addition and subtraction and multiplication and division. And the key reason for that is that there is no 32-bit multiplier. Remember that um, since the beginning, we talked about the challenges that exist to create processing elements inside uh, memory arrays. Um, the, the, um, the, the different technology is very different from um, CMOS technology. So it's, it's pretty challenging to um, design a high performance processor um, with different technology. And this is the key reason why the DPUs don't have a 32-bit multiplier. Instead, what we are doing is what they are doing is emulating multiplication and division by using one instruction that performs bit shifting and addition in one cycle. Bit shifting and addition is essentially what we do ourselves when we multiply um, uh, two values, uh, two numbers with uh, paper and pencil. Uh, the problem with this is that the multiplication and the division of 32-bit uh, integers might take 
up to 32 instructions. And that's what makes that this <clears throat> throughput is getting reduced that much between, I mean, the, this uh, large difference between addition and subtraction and multiplication and division. Another observation is the large throughput difference between integers and floating point uh, data types. And the reason is similar to uh, what uh, we just um, saw for multiplication. The key reason for this uh, difference in throughput is that the hardware itself, the DPUs don't support um, floating point operands. And these floating point operations are emulated um, uh, by the runtime library. And this is what leads to much lower throughput. So if you want to take a closer look at the um, micro benchmarks or maybe even um, use them, uh, if you have access to an admin system, uh, you can download them from our repository. Okay, now we know what's the maximum throughput that we can achieve here in this pipeline for different types of instructions and data types. Now let's see how fast we can access data from this WRAM, either reading or writing uh, data from this WRAM that is going to be used in this pipeline to perform the arithmetic operations. To do so, we define a new micro benchmark. In this case, <clears throat> our micro benchmark resembles the stream benchmark, the popular stream benchmark. We are going to uh, present the stream benchmark in the next slide. A stream has four different versions, copy, add, scale, and triad. And the operations performing add, scale, and triad are addition, multiplication, and addition, and multiplication, respectively. In our experiments, we vary the number of tasklets from 1 to 16, and we show results for one DPU. There is uh, one uh, thing to mention here is that in these experiments, we are not including the accesses to NRAM in our program. The reason is that we don't want to uh, make any noise in, in the measurement to the access to WRAM. And this is the, uh, let's say, the relevant code excerpt for the different versions of the stream benchmark. In the first, the, so here, uh, right now, what you see is the uh, copy uh, stream benchmark. In copy stream benchmark, what we simply do is going over one array, in this case, uh, buffer A and buffer B are both in WRAM. So what we do is going over buffer A element by element in WRAM, reading each element and writing it um, into the uh, output uh, array, which is buffer B. Uh, then we have add. In add, we are using three arrays. Uh, two of the arrays are input arrays. So we read elements from these two arrays. We add them and store the result in the output buffer C in this case. Uh, in a scale, what we do is reading uh, from the input array, we multiply by a scalar, and then we store um, in the output array. And finally, in triad, we again have two input arrays, buffer A and buffer B, and we perform, as you see, one multiplication and one addition, and we store the result in buffer C. So um, we can count what's the amount of data movement and um, an amount of operations that we have in each of these versions. Um, assuming that we are using, let's say, 64-bit um, integers in our experiment, uh, here we would be reading eight bytes from WRAM and writing eight bytes to WRAM, and there are no arithmetic operations. In add, we are reading 16 bytes, eight bytes coming from buffer A, eight bytes coming from buffer B, and uh, we perform one addition and store the result eight bytes in buffer C. For a scale, we are reading eight bytes, writing eight bytes, and performing one multiplication. And for triad, we are reading 16 bytes, writing eight bytes, and performing one multiplication and one addition. So here are the results. Um, in the plot, you'll see how we present the sustained WRAM bandwidth in megabytes per second. Uh, over the number of tasklets. So here, remember, we are changing the number of tasklets between one and 16. So these are the results for copy, these are the results for add, and these are for scale and triad. And, and these are the bandwidth numbers that, uh, bandwidth values that we are uh, measuring in our experiments. But we can also estimate what's the bandwidth, and these can help us understand the architecture better. 
Um, we are going to assume that in um, for, for our estimation of the maximum bandwidth, we are going to assume that the pipeline is full, and this is and this happens after eleven tasklets, as you know, and actually as you see um, in the plot, uh, the, uh, the the sustained WRAM bandwidth in all cases um, saturates at eleven tasklets, as we could expect. Um, so we assume that the pipeline is full and bytes is the number of bytes uh, that we read and write in each cycle, uh, in each iteration of these uh, micro benchmarks. Um, this way we can estimate the WRAM bandwidth in bytes per second as the uh, number of bytes that we are moving times the frequency of the DPU divided by the number of instructions that we need for each of these um, specific uh, operations, either copy, add, scale, and triad. So in the case of copy, we are just reading uh, from WRAM and writing uh, into WRAM. So it's just two instructions, a WRAM load and a WRAM store. And uh, with these two instructions, we are moving uh, 16 bytes. With, uh, uh, with, with two of these instructions, we are moving 16 bytes because the data type that we are using here in these experiments is integer 64 bytes, uh, 64 bits. So it, that, that's uh, each of them is eight bytes. And um, if the pipeline is full, uh, meaning we are using 11 or more tasklets, we are going to need a certain number of cycles to move a certain amount of data. So if we have 11 tasklets in one iteration of the loop, um, we move in total, 11 times 16 bytes, and uh, we need 22 cycles to do this because with 11 tasklets uh, and two instructions, we need to wait uh, 22 cycles for the operation to be completed. So by using these numbers, we can estimate the WRAM bandwidth for copy as 2,800 megabytes per second at a frequency of 350 megahertz. And as you can see, uh, in the slide, you can see uh, in the plot, it's more or less what we are measuring in our experiments. And for us, this something very similar. We can use exactly the same expression and reason in a similar way. In this case, for addition, we need five instructions because there are two loads, one at one at C, because we are operating on 64 by 64 bit elements and one store. And remember as well that in the addition, we have two input arrays and one output array. So in every iteration of the for loop, uh, we read two elements and write one element. And these elements are eight bytes in size. So that means 24 bytes. If we have 11 tasklets in the pipeline, in total, we would be moving 11 times 24 bytes in 55 cycles, 11 uh, tasklets times the number of instructions that is five. So in this case, our estimate is 1,680 megabytes per second. That is also very similar to what we have measured. And we can uh, do similar uh, calculations, similar estimations for scale and triad as well. Um, Another uh, interesting observation with respect to the uh, WRAM bandwidth is that all WRAM loads and stores take one cycle when the DPU pipeline is full. And what that means is that the actual sustained bandwidth that we can obtain when accessing WRAM is independent of the memory access pattern. There is, it, this is not a banked memory or uh, anything like that. Every time that we go to WRAM, we are reading eight bytes and no matter how our accesses are, whether they are uh, unit stride, strided, or random, we always get eight bytes in one cycle. And that's what makes that the uh, sustained effective bandwidth of WRAM is independent of the um, access pattern. Same as before, <clears throat> our code is publicly available and we have, um, you know, the, the it's in our repository, the versions of the stream benchmark and also uh, the different, um, this um, uh, experiment with different uh, access patterns uh, to WRAM. Okay, now we already understand how the instructions or how fast the instructions are executed in the pipeline, how fast we can access data from WRAM. Now it's time to check uh, how fast we can access data from uh, NRAM.
So in, in summary, how fast we can move the uh, operands between MRAM and WRAM using this DMA engine. Um, so our goal is to measure the MRAM bandwidth for different access patterns. Um, we create also several micro benchmarks here. Uh, in the with the first one, what we are going to do is just measuring what's the latency of a single DMA transfer for different um, uh, transfer sizes. Um, the uh, um, AppMem SDK provides uh, two instructions to move data between MRAM and WRAM um, to handle these DMA transfers. And um, these instructions are MRAM read and MRAM write. So with an MRAM read, we are reading from MRAM and writing into WRAM with an MRAM write is the, in the opposite direction. We are also going to use the stream benchmark here. Um, same as before, you're already familiar with uh, how the for loop of a stream benchmark looks. Um, we are going to um, anyway uh, see the corresponding versions as well in, the, in, in one slide. Uh, we have also created micro benchmarks for strided access patterns. And we actually have two different ways of doing strided access patterns uh, for, you, for, for everyone to be on the same page. Just let me uh, tell you that a strided access pattern is when consecutive accesses to uh, memory are at a certain distance and this distance is fixed. Um, uh, the access can be a stride equal one. In that case, we talk about unit stride or a stream accessing a streaming or um, the stride might be more than one, might be two, might be four, might be five, etc. We have experimented with different strides as well. And then we create as well uh, one micro benchmark uh, to measure what's the bandwidth for random access patterns. And this uh, micro benchmark is based on the popular GAPS benchmark. In this case, we include the accesses to MRAM, makes sense, as opposed to uh, what, did, what we did uh, for uh, WRAM. But here it makes sense because that's uh, actually what we want to measure the bandwidth, uh, the latency and bandwidth to WRAM, to MRAM. Okay, let's just start with the latency. So here um, you have two plots. One is for MRAN read, the other one is for MRAN write. Uh, on the um, left uh, y axis, uh, we have the bandwidth in megabytes per second. On the right y axis of each plot, we have the latency in cycles. And here at the bottom, because we are measuring the latency for a single um, MRAN read or MRAN write, uh, what we have is the um, data transfer size. So we are um, using transfers from eight to 2048 bytes, as you can see um, in the slide. And these are the results. Uh, the lighter blue is the latency, the darker blue is the bandwidth. The way that we obtain the bandwidth is from the latency measurement that we, what, that we um, uh, do. Um, this, uh, so we are measuring the latency in cycles and then using this expression here, we uh, obtain the uh, bandwidth. Notice that in this expression, we uh, have the size, the size of the transfer, either eight, 16 or 2048 bytes. And, um, and we multiply that by the frequency because uh, the MRAM latency is measured um, in cycles. And one thing that we observe as well is that we can model the MRAM latency that we measure, we can model it with a linear expression expression that looks like this. It's alpha plus beta times size. And, uh, and notice that our model or linear expression matches pretty well what are uh, our measurements for both MRAN read and MRAN write. And actually according to our measurements and according to this expression, uh, beta equals 0 0.5 cycles per byte and this beta uh, is essentially the inverse of the bandwidth that we can obtain from uh, MRAM, as we will see. Uh, and actually, by, by uh, using this beta, we can estimate the theoretical maximum MRAM bandwidth in 700 megabytes per second in a single DPU um, at a frequency of 350 megahertz. So uh, one uh, key observation here is that the latency of the um, MRAM accesses increases linearly with the transfer size. As you see, um, the larger the size, the larger is going to be um, this MRAM latency um, and, and, and the dependence is linear as you see from the expression. And also 
and according to our measurements, the maximum theoretical MRAM bandwidth is two bytes per cycle, which means uh, up to 700 megabytes per second at a frequency of 350 megahertz. Okay, another observation is that MRAM read and MRAM write are symmetric. As you see, the both uh, curves here, bandwidth and latency are very similar for both uh, MRAM read and MRAM write. Um, the other observation here is that the, um, it's, it's better to use larger transfers, right? So if, if you are going to access the data that you bring from the WRAM, from the MRAM to the WRAM, it's better to use larger uh, uh, data transfers, essentially because we are exploiting higher bandwidth. So uh, as you see for 1024 or 2000, 48, we are in the maximum. And actually here, the bandwidth is already pretty flat and it's uh, significantly higher than for eight or 16 bytes. Another observation here is that the uh, MRAM latency is pretty flat between uh, eight and uh, 128 bytes. And the reason is that for small transfers, the fixed cost alpha of the linear expression that we presented before dominates the variable cost beta time size. So um, one programming recommendation is kind of ninja programming recommendation because you really, uh, you really uh, have to know what you're doing. But the programming recommendation here is that uh, because the latency, the, the, latency the, the, the difference in latency between bringing eight bytes or bringing 128 bytes to the WRAM is so small, it might make sense to bring 128 bytes because maybe after um, using the first eight bytes, we can make use of the remaining 120 bytes that are already in WRAM. And to do so, the only thing that we gonna need to do in our code is checking is if something is in WRAM, one particular address has been brought to WRAM before going to MRAM to fetch uh, new data. Okay, another observation, interesting one, is that uh, the 2048 byte transfers are only 4% faster than the 1024 byte transfers. Uh, as you see, the bandwidth is uh, pretty flat for uh, these two transfer sizes. Um, so, however, there is uh, one consideration here. In principle, you could say, okay, if I want to maximize my bandwidth and I know that I'm going to use all the data that I'm bringing to WRAM, let's use the larger transfer that we can use in this case, 2048. But that has also its own uh, dark side, its own drawback. Uh, the fact that I'm bringing a larger chunk from WRAM, from MRAM to WRAM means that I need to allocate that space in WRAM. And the total amount of WRAM is relatively small. It's only 64 kilobytes. And these 64 kilobytes are uh, shared by all tasklets that we are running on the same DPU. So if we are using 16 tasklets, it's only two uh, kilobytes per tasklet, right? Out of the um, 64 kilobytes. So um, what this means is that we may end up, depending on, on, on how much uh, data, or how much space we need to allocate in WRAM for each uh, tasklet, uh, it may end up happening that we need to reduce the number of tasklets that we use, right? Uh, observe the um, e e example that I just gave you. You have 64 kilobytes in total. Um, if you are using uh, 16 tasklets, this means uh, four kilobytes per tasklet. Um, if you, if your uh, transfers are, you use transfer of 2048 bytes, that means that you can only have two arrays of uh, 2048. So if you eventually need to hold data from a third array, you couldn't fit um, in the amount of space that you have. And in that case, you would need to reduce the uh, number of tasks that you use in the program. If you don't want that to happen, what you can do is using a smaller transfers. 1,024 byte transfers would allow you to have uh, four um, uh, arrays uh, of 1,024 byte allocated in WRAM 
per task level. So this might be important in terms of the occupancy of the DPU <clears throat> or the number of tasklets, <clears throat> sorry, that we are running on the system. Okay, let's go to the uh, next experiment here. This is the um, stream benchmark. Let's let's uh, measure directly what's the uh, bandwidth that we can obtain from the MRAM. You, you, you are already familiar with this uh, copy stream benchmark. It's just uh, reading from WRAM and writing into WRAM in a different array. But here we are also including their accesses to MRAM. Um, so we have to have this MRAM read that brings something from uh, MRAM into the buffer A. And after moving data um, in WRAM, we have to write back the uh, from buffer, uh, so from buffer B in WRAM to uh, the corresponding uh, memory address in MRAM. We have another version of the stream benchmark, and um, and, and and we create this this version because if you really want to do what the original copy uh, benchmark does, is just moving the contents of one array to another array in MRAM. You don't really need to do it using WRAM, right? You can simply or or or, or let's say streaming over all the elements in WRAM. You can simply copy from MRAM to buffer A, and then uh, copy from uh, buffer A to, um, uh, to the de destination address so that is uh, uh, whatever, address B. Uh, there is a, a small typo here. This should also be buffer A because we are bringing from MRAM to buffer A and then from buffer A back to um, MRAM. And let's observe what are the uh, results for uh, the stream benchmark. First one is copy DMA, this, this version that doesn't go uh, through WRAM. Uh, what we observe here, first observation here, is that the sustained bandwidth of copy DMA is close to the theoretical maximum of 700 uh, megabytes per second that we estimated before. So for a large system and the larger uh, admin-based beam system that we have tested had, uh, 2,556 DPUs, the uh, uh, aggregated uh, bandwidth is uh, around 1.6 terabytes per second, which is uh, pretty high. One observation as well here is that for the copy DMA engine, the, uh, the, the, sorry, the copy DMA uh, micro benchmark, the uh, arithmetic, the um, bandwidth saturates at two tasklets. The reason for that is simply that using more than one tasklet makes sure that there is always a DMA request waiting in the queue, and this um, keeps the DMA engine busy. But there is no really, not really um, parallelism in the accesses from different tasklets because there is a single DMA engine, and this DMA engine can only sustain one uh, access at a time, one um, yeah, transfer at a time. Now we can take a look at the uh, bandwidth for copy and add. And what we observe here is that uh, the bandwidth uh, for copy and add saturates at four and six tasklets respectively. However, for scale and triad, the saturation point is at 11 tasklets. Uh, the reason for this is that as we, we start increasing the number of tasklets from one uh, to four or to six, what we are doing is also increasing the total latency of the data transfers of the MRAM WRAM and WRAM MRAM transfers that we are um, that we are requesting to the DME engine because these transfers are sequential because there is a single DME engine and it can only sustain a single transfer at a time. Uh, every time that we start executing a new tasklet, we are increasing. Uh, the total latency of access to MRAM, right? And uh, what happens for these two uh, particular benchmarks, um, uh, copy and add, is that uh, after four and six tasklets, respectively, this latency of the MRAM accesses becomes longer than the pipeline latency, that the execution of instructions in the pipeline for these particular micro benchmarks. However, for a scale and triad, regardless of the number of tasklets that we are using, um, the latency of the pipeline is always uh, larger. And, uh, and because that happens 
uh, we, uh, or, or these two microventricles saturate at 11 tasklets because the pipeline saturates at 11 tasklets, as you already know. So uh, important observations here are, if one particular workload saturates with uh, less than 11 tasklets, it's likely that the uh, access latency uh, to the MRAM bank is hiding the uh, execution of instructions in the pipeline. And we call this a memory bound workload in this architecture. However, if it happens the other way around, if the throughput saturates, the performance saturates at 11 tasklets, this means that the pipeline latency hides the latency of accesses to MRAM. And this is what we call a compute bound workload on this architecture. Okay, uh, next experiment is for strided access pattern and for the random access pattern. And as I said before, we have two different ways of doing the strided access patterns. For the random access pattern, we only use one of these two ways. These two ways are coarse grain strided access and fine grain strided access. In the coarse grain strided access, what we essentially do is bringing a whole chunk of uh, data from MRAM to the WRAM and then we perform the accesses in WRAM. And we perform these accesses in a strided manner with a certain stride. And yet this is what you can see here. Instead of um, uh, increasing this index i by one in every uh, iteration, we are doing it by a stride. So if this is, for example, two, we could be only accessing the even numbered elements of um, buffer A and buffer B. So this is the, um, in, in, in this case, we are, First of all, performing this um, MRAM read operation for both input arrays A and B. Uh, then we stride, uh, so we perform the strided accesses um, in WRAM, and finally we write from WRAM to the MRAM, the say output of this of the accesses. In the case of the fine grain strided, and also in the case of the random accesses, we don't use um, or we don't perform the accesses. Uh, inside WRAM, uh, we simply go to MRAM to fetch one element, to fetch the element that we need. In this case, and that's the reason why we are only transferring in both this MRAM read and MRAM write, we are only transferring a 64-bit um, uh, uh, unsigned int. It's just one single element of the input arrays. Okay. So let's take a look at the results. Again, we have in the y-axis, we have a sustained NRAM bandwidth. And the left-hand side, we have the results for coarse grain strided accesses. In the right-hand side, we have the results for fine grain strided and random accesses. And these are the results uh, for different number of tasklets. Each curve corresponds to a different number of tasklets. And at the bottom in the x-axis, what we have is the stride that we are using in the strided accesses. And also uh, here, this last column um, here, the 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 the, mo the, the rightmost one uh, corresponds to the uh, results of uh, the gaps benchmark, the random access patterns. So uh, first observation here is that there is a large uh, difference in the sustained maximum and the maximum sustained bandwidth between the coarse grain and the fine grain DMA. Uh, notice that the maximum uh, bandwidth for the coarse grain DMA access. Um, it's, uh, it's for stride one, which means that we are using all the elements that we are reading from MRAM and placing them into WRAM. And uh, this large difference in the, in the um, bandwidth, in the sustained bandwidth, is due to the uh, transfers that we are using. Either uh, <clears throat> 1024 byte transfers for the coarse grain straighted access or only eight byte transfers for the fine grain um, DMA access. And in random access, as you see, we achieve very uh, similar maximum sustained bandwidth because we are using the same type of transfers. Another observation is that the uh, sustained MRAM bandwidth of the coarse grain DMA accesses decreases the stride, decreases as the stride increases. The reason for that is that uh, in reality, we are bringing a whole chunk but we are not using all the elements that we are bringing when we increase the stride. For two, we could be only using half of the elements that we moved from MRAM to WRAM. With a stride of four means that we are only using one fourth 
of the transfer data. Uh, so essentially what we are doing is dividing the effective bandwidth because we are uh, uh, not utilizing all the elements or the data that we are bringing from WRAM to MRAM. And that's what makes that the effective bandwidth uh, decreases that much. Another observation is that after uh, 16 tasklets, uh, sorry, after a stride of 16, uh, the coarse grain stride access provides lower bandwidth than the fine grain strided access. As you see, this actually, this 77 corresponds to a stride of eight uh, after 16. Uh, so for a stride of 16, it's uh, essentially half of these 77, and that's already smaller than this 72.58 that you see here on the right. So yeah, with a stride of 16, we are only using 1 16th of the uh, maximum bandwidth, and that's what makes that uh, it's, let's say, more efficient to use the fine grain accesses. So uh, this is also a programming recommendation, depending on how are we going to access memory, depending on what's the stride, if we are using strided accesses in our workloads, uh, we are going to prefer uh, either a coarse grain approach or fine grain approach, um, uh, yeah, depending on the stride. And these codes are also <clears throat> available in our repository. <clears throat> and the last, the, last, um, the last set of uh, experimental results that I want to show you are connecting the whole thing. First, first of all, we uh, focus on measuring the arithmetic throughput. Then we have measured what's the bandwidth to WRAM, to MRAM. Now we are going to compare the arithmetic throughput um, depending on the operational intensity to the um, latency of access to the MRAM and the bandwidth of access to the, to the MRAM. And to do so, we create uh, one micro benchmark that is going to characterize the uh, memory bound regions and compute bound regions for different data types and operations. This micro benchmark loads one chunk uh, of an array in MRAM into WRAM, then performs a variable number of operations on the data of this uh, array, and then write, writes back to uh, MRAM. The experiment, as you will see, is inspired by the roofline model, a methodology that uh, presents the performance of a program based on its arithmetic intensity or operational intensity. In, in our particular experiment, we define the operational intensity as the number of arithmetic operations performed per byte accessed from MRAM. So we measured this operational intensity in uh, operations per byte. And um, in this particular experiment, uh, we are varying, that we are changing the number of operations that we perform on the data. So we are changing the operational intensity in different experiments. However, the size of the transfers is always the same. Uh, the size of the MRAM WRAM transfers is always the same. So the MRAM access latency is fixed. And, uh, and this is the micro benchmark. I don't want to uh, spend much time here, but uh, here you can see the uh, transfer from MRAM to WRAM, the MRAM read. Uh, here we have the uh, operation itself, in this case, one uh, addition, and this is the uh, MRAM write. And as you see, we have a couple of for loops uh, these four loops uh, uh, are, you know, to uh, let's say control what's the operational intensity, how many um, operations we perform on the um, a specific, um, uh, I mean, the values that we have in, in WRAM. Uh, the, the, there is uh, some stride here because for very low operational intensity, we are not even going to operate on all the elements of the array. So we would be jumping for higher operational intensity, the stride is equal to one. And what we do is uh, repeating many times on, on each uh, element of uh, buffer A. And here you can see some results. These are for addition and multiplication of 32-bit uh, integers and floating point, single precision floating point. The plots present the arithmetic throughput uh, in the y-axis. Uh, over the operational intensity from very, very low values. This could be just one operation every 2048 bytes. Uh, 
this would be eight operations per byte. So from very, very low to relatively high operational intensity uh, in all experiments. Um, yeah, and, and, and here you see uh, as I, the, the results, as I said, for 32 bit uh, integer multiplication and addition for uh, multiplication and addition of uh, single precision floating point. Uh, one first observation here is that the trends are pretty similar. We see some uh, you know, part uh, of, the, uh, of the plots where we see how the arithmetic throughput increases with the operational intensity. And at some point, these arithmetic throughput saturates and it remains flat after that. And we can take a closer look, more detailed look at uh, one of the plots, in particular, uh, this one, addition of 32-bit uh, uh, integers. Uh, this uh, result here is the arithmetic throughput for a single casklet and for this low arithmetic uh, intensity of 1 over 2048. This is the arithmetic throughput for two tasklets. We see that it increases slightly. But after that, the arithmetic throughput remains flat for higher number of tasks. Why is that? The throughput saturates at less than 11 tasks. And remember uh, one of the uh, observations from previous slides. If the, the performance of a program saturates with less than 11 tasks, it's probably because the workloads, the workload or the program uh, is um, behaving as a memory bound on this architecture. And as you see, this trend more or less remains until higher values of the operational intensity. So even for one over 64, we still, uh, the throughput is still saturates with only two tasklets. After that, for one over 32, it saturates in three tasklets. So we need more tasklets to saturate the throughput, which means that we are getting closer to the compute bound um, area of the roof line and uh, the trend continues, but also we need more tasklets to achieve the higher throughput. And at some point we see how the throughput starts saturating at 11 tasklets and uh, it remains uh, constant up to 16 tasklets, which is the maximum, maximum number of tasklets that we have used in our experiments. And these are the results for higher operational intensity. So, uh, here we can differentiate between the memory bound region where the arithmetic throughput increases with the operational intensity and also the uh, saturation of the arithmetic throughput happens with less than 11 tasklets and the compute bound region where the arithmetic throughput is flat at its maximum and uh, the performance, the throughput saturates at 11 tasklets. And the transition between the memory bound region and the compute bound region is what we call the throughput saturation point. As you can see, it's very low. Um, even uh, in this micro benchmark, it's as low as one fourth, one operation uh, every four bytes. That essentially is one integer addition every 32 bit element that we fetch uh, from memory. And the throughput saturation point is uh, actually very low in all cases, is even lower <coughs> for multiplication or for <coughs> floating point operands. And the fact that it's um, so low, this um, saturation point is so low, means that uh, we can expect that most of real world workloads are going to be in the compute bound area of the processor. So we can say that this is a compute bound processor. Okay, and, and here you can access the, um, uh, the code as well from our repository. So um, in order to summarize, I would say that uh, one key takeaway of this lecture is um, this differentiation between memory bound region and compute bound region, depending on what's the operational intensity of our workload we have um, observe this by using a very simple but very powerful uh, micro benchmark. We notice that the throughput saturation point is very low in all cases, even for uh, integer additions is as low as one fourth. Uh, so uh, key takeaway here is that the admin PIM architecture is fundamentally a compute bound processor. Uh, so we expect that most real world workloads will be compute bound um, in this architecture, but 
Of course, we should also expect that the most suitable workloads are memory bound in conventional architectures. We will continue talking about the uh, admin pin system in later lectures, probably not the next one. Uh, we are going to talk about uh, how to program uh, uh, this uh, admin pin system in a later lecture. And we will see uh, more benchmarking that we did with uh, real world um, compute patterns. Um, but uh, yeah, if you cannot wait, you can go to our paper and read it or uh, watch some of the previous lectures or uh, talks that we have uh, delivered on the topic. And in later lectures, we will continue talking about uh, real world processing in memory architectures. Next lecture, uh, we will talk about the uh, Samsung uh, HVM team architecture, and uh, we will probably uh, show as well uh, some details about the uh, SK Hynix architecture. And um, as I said before, in later lectures, we will continue talking about the PIMC, the admin PIM system, uh, um, working on, um, I mean, how to program this system. And, um, and we will uh, talk as well about how characterized workloads to identify uh, PIM suitability. So this is all for today. I don't